Hey everybody, I'm down here. I'm going to do a little bit of an experiment. I want to work a little bit on... Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, coolant for the TIG Torch uh, cooler that I was working on. So this will be part two of the Dynaflux cooler. All right, so choices for coolant. What you should or shouldn't use. Hmm, well, depending on who you ask, you can get different answers. So what did I find uh, in this cool... in this this cooler when I got it in the reservoir was some sort of water. I don't know what type of water. I don't know if it was just plain tap water or what. Um, several people have said, yeah, they use straight tap water. Uh, some people have even said they were call working in shops where they actually didn't even have a cooler at all. They just had a line that was hooked up to a tap and they would open the tap and the water would flow through the torch, cool it, and then dump down the drain. So uh, you know, that's over time you end up wasting water, but it's probably pretty effective because pretty much anywhere you go in the United States, it probably might be the same everywhere, but you, if you run the tap long enough, the temperature of that cold water tends to stabilize at around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And that has to do with the fact that when you dig down uh, past a certain point, the soil temperature stabilizes no matter where you are in the country at around 50 degrees Fahrenheit unless there's some sort of weird geologic feature that is changing that temperature. Obviously if you, you know, go to Old Faithful and dig down, you're going to find something completely more alarming. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention you'll be arrested. Okay, so getting back to this. So, all right, why can't you use just regular tap water? Well, really the answer to that is in the fact that the ideal coolant for your TIG cooler system is going to be a liquid that will provide several different features. One feature is an antifreeze feature. Okay. Um, now, that may not be important to, to a lot of people because they may have their TIG set up in a shop that never freezes. But if, let's say, you have a garage that's not heated all the time and you have your TIG cooler in there and you put tap water in it and you forget it and you just leave it alone and then that winter you uh, have the temperature go down low enough where it freezes, you, quite frankly, you're going to probably very be, be very disappointed when it cracks something. It cracks either the reservoir or lines or who knows what. I mean, it could e even crack a metal pump housing because uh, the power of freezing water to, uh, I mean, in nature, it cracks rock. So that goes without saying. You don't want to do that if you, if you are going to have this in a cold environment. You either have to make sure that the, the lines are blown out and it's drained any time that you're not using it and it's going to be unheated and get down to that low temperature, or you need to have something that has some sort of an antifreeze component to it. The other component that would be nice to have would be, depending on what kind of system you have, an anti-corrosive component. You may have parts of your system that will react with tap water and cause corrosion. That uh, is not good, so you might want an anti-corrosive component to the water. Another component of the water is, um, another component you want with the water would be the um, ability to provide some to some type of lubrication depending on the type of pump that you have, uh, whether it be a vein pump, gear pump, or what. Uh, so that might be an important component for some coolers and not very important for other coolers. And then I would say that's probably the uh, major components there. Oh, uh, and uh, I forgot another major component. Another major component is you would like the liquid to be, I believe, dielectric is the term, but basically you don't want it to easily conduct electricity. So that leads me to, well, okay, regular tap water. Hey Steve, what about thermal conductivity? Pop question. Does water conduct electricity? Well, yes and no. My understanding, and I'm going to test this little theory right now, my understanding is that pure water without the mineral content like this distilled water is supposed to not conduct electricity or it's not supposed to conduct electricity easily 
anywhere near as easily as tap water and that the difference between the two is minerals, mineral content of the water. So, if you've ever, if you've ever had a taste of distilled water, it doesn't taste very good. And I think the reason why is because I think that good bottled water will actually have minerals present that actually alter the taste of the water. There are other things that can alter the taste of the water, like sulfur, for instance, uh, in a negative way. Um, but just getting back to the, the whole idea about minerals, um, I remember I used to drink uh, Dasani brand um, bottled water. And I always wondered, why the heck did that bottled water always seem to taste so different to me than other brands of bottled water? And then I don't remember if I read it on the label or looked it up online or what, but uh, apparently Dasani has a certain blend of minerals that is what gives it its taste, and it's kind of unique. So it's almost like a doctored bottled water. I don't think it comes out that way naturally, but I may be wrong on that. And Hey, don't listen to me. I'm just one of these uh, fringe lunatics. So... All right, so what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a little bit of tap water. How am I going to measure the conductivity? Well, I'm not going to do a very official, you know, laboratory scale measurement here. I'm just going to use my good old ohm meter, which basically the way it measures resistance, it works on the principle of using, um, there's a nine volt battery in here as a power source and the way it measures the resistance is it it looks at how much current it can get to flow through whatever is being measured for lack of without getting overly complicated essentially we're going to see a change in the reading here um, and what I want to see is I want to see whether or not there's much of a change from one liquid to the other so I'm going to check tap water I'm going to check the distilled water and then I'm gonna check RV antifreeze because this is cheap stuff now before I start let me mention of course there is a specific liquid that is recommended by the manufacturer for use in this cooler this water cooler so why am, why am I not buying that well I'll tell you the reason why I'm not buying it is because um, it's selling for, like, I think the cheapest price I could find online was $30 a gallon. Now I'm going to go eat supper and I'll be right back. All right. So I got the meter lead shorted right now, 0.3 ohms. Let's, uh, throw this in the tap water and see what happens. So you can see it's definitely conducting, um, it's reading about uh, 3 million ohms. And one of the problems with my little experiment here is that, you know, the more I submerge the leads, the more surface area of metal that's in contact with water, that's probably going to change things. Um, the distance between the leads might also change it, but it's actually pretty stable. Uh, now that it's had a little time to stabilize, it's around 3.53 mega ohms. So now let's repeat that with uh, the distilled water. Now, this is El Cheapo brand, uh, supermarket branded distilled water. So I'm not quite sure what, uh, I mean, what qualifications it meets. I mean, I don't know what they have to do before they can legally market it as actual distilled water. I would imagine there are certain grades of distilled water just like anything else. Well, all right, so so much for that idea because I could see that that's, that's conducting just like the uh, tap water, only the resistance is higher. You can see it's climbing there. It's, uh, you know, I also wonder whether or not it made much of a difference the fact that I uh, didn't dry off the water from the uh, 
the meter probe and alligator clip there. So, you know, six. It's still climbing a little bit, but I bet you it's pretty safe to say that's going to starting to slow down quite a bit now. I mean, that's not going to go above probably six and a half meg, no matter how long I leave it in there. And so lastly, I want to try the pink lemonade. Oh, I mean the uh, antifreeze. <laughs> Boy, don't put this stuff in your refrigerator unless it's in a clearly marked container. Looks just like pink lemonade. Oh, what a surprise. Basically, looks like that's gonna climb a little bit and be pretty much on par with tap water, I'm betting. So, uh, yeah. so as far as conductivity goes, um, none of the, neither the distilled water nor the, uh, um, antifreeze is doing me much good on that front now my big question is i wonder if i had the expensive 30 dollar a gallon stuff sitting here and i measured it what would i get well guys wasn't quite sure what i should do so i uh decided to turn to the internet for answers boy was that a mistake uh all you have to do is put in uh well um this type of antifreeze this particular brand and I think most of these non-toxic RV antifreeze are um, mainly propylene gly glycol based as opposed to many automotive antifreezes which are I believe ethylene glycol based well turns out uh, now I should add that this also ingredients are propylene glycol with dipotassium hydrogen phosphate inhibitor uh, and colorant added okay so anyways if you just google propylene glycol tig torch cooler you'll get um, links to a whole bunch of different forums where this whole subject is described ad nauseum in some of these forums the uh, debate got downright nasty I mean name calling rudeness uh, just amazing how uh, passionate some people were about the subject um, you get a lot of points of view from the from the viewpoint of hey you should only use what the manufacturer of the cooler specified because they're the best judge of that and the stuff is only 25 or 30 dollars a gallon so you should just spend the money for that then you get the viewpoint from other people that are like, well, they think that the manufacturer is just taking a much cheaper product and rebranding it and charging you, you know, three, four, five times as much as what they should be charging you so that you should just go with some other alternative. And one of the alternatives that came up a lot was distil distilled water. Um, Several guys use regular tap water mixed with Dexcol antifreeze. Some just say, hey, it's the green stuff antifreeze they use, which is interesting. You know, one guy brought up a valid point. Thought it, I thought it was valid. He pointed out the fact that he said, you know, if it's an older TIG welder, it was designed to be used with tap water running through the cooling torch. So... You know, kind of like all this, hey, got to be low con conductivity and everything. That His point being that apparently the low conductivity argument uh, is that you need that so that the high frequency doesn't get bleeded off to ground and give you problems with the high frequency start. But I think his point was that these machines, these older machines, like my big Airco, were uh, designed with such high output high frequency I guess for lack of a better term that uh, they were designed to be able to overcome this kind of a problem so I don't know then the guys who just used water like distilled water some of them said ah you want to add an algicide so you don't get algae growth and then um, some of them said oh yeah well if you do that then you get to add some antifreeze so some use a mixture of of the RV antifreeze and the distilled water. Some use a mixture of, like I said, the automotive antifreeze and distilled water. Some use automotive antifreeze and tap water. 
Um, there's quite a few different combinations out there. So here's what I decided I'm going to do. Um, I do believe that this antifreeze here, this RV antifreeze, will provide some of the protection to my pump because it says right on here, it says all ingredients are, well, where is it, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it says it is non-injurious to copper, brass, and to all types of plastic except acetate. So, um, non-injurious. I'm thinking that they're basically saying it's not going to eat away at that product, which makes me think that it does have some rust inhibitor um, quality to it. So, I think what I'm going to do is, I think I need about two gallons. I think I'm going to run a gallon of this with a gallon of distilled water. And I'm going to run with that. And if I have problems with the high frequency start and I can't seem to figure out why, I'm going to uh, change out the coolant to a, uh, a low conductivity coolant and see what happens. And that's interesting too. I don't remember what the specs were on the coolant that I found online that is supposed to be used in the Dynaflux cooler. But I noticed when you went on the Miller sites and you looked at it that there were there was a, a low conductivity cooler and then there was another one that didn't say whether or not it was low conductivity. So that made me kind of wonder if the cooler manufacturer is 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 um, specking that coolant for their unit. Does that necessarily automatically mean that it's going to be good for a unit with high frequency? I don't know. Who knows? I do know this, after this sits for a while, the uh, resistance goes up to 8.32 meg ohms. I mean, that's over 8 million ohms. It seems like it's not exactly low resistance. 